I want to warn you. What you're about to see may be offensive. This episode may not be exactly politically correct. We're going to hit some controversial topics. Not everyone will agree, especially sales and marketing. I wanted to prepare you for what you're about to see. Let's get to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your politically incorrect, passionate, and fair host, Eric Wilson. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That's eric at ibf.org. And we have a fair and great sponsor in Archiva, your one plan SNOP software solution. So check them out. As I said, this is going to be a little controversial. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rip the band-aid off. I'm gonna come out and say it at the very beginning here. Okay, you ready? All items are not created equal. We should not create, we should not treat all items equally. All customers are not created equal. So therefore, there are items that are better than other items. I said it. I, I, it just had to be said, and I'm the one who had to say it. So if, if this is true, and we all know it, we all know, except for some people in sales, that all items are not created equal, then why do we assume our accuracy should be the same for all items? Why do we assume our accuracy should be the same for all customers? Why do we assume our accuracy should be, between planners should be the same? Why do we treat them the same? If this isn't, then we need to understand the underlining forecastability of those items is what we have to get to. And, and, and believe me, forecastability should be a word. We're lobbying it to have it in the next Webster dictionary. And right now, it, you can find it in the IBF uh, glossary, but we're going to make it to the Webster dictionary. Yes, forecastability needs to be a word. Because it really needs to be what we, if we understand if all items aren't created equal, it's what we need to measure against. It's what we need to understand to be able to understand the underlining uncertainty in an item so we can then understand what kind of accuracy we should, what, what kind of resources we should apply. Because some items are more important, some customers are more important, some item customer okay, combinations are more important. Let's devote our resources to them. We actually talked about this eight years ago is when I had the, the you know, discussions with someone from, ironically, from Arkiva. And I wanted to have him back on as our special guest for today. Sujit is the COO at Arkiva. He has been with the company now for 23 years. As a consultant, he has helped companies in many industries improve their demand, planning, and forecasting. He has broad and pretty deep knowledge in multiple subjects matters related to forecasting, supply chain, business operations, analytics. He frequently contributes articles for Arkiva's blog and as well as other publications, including the Journal of Business Forecasting. I said we actually co-authored an article for Foresight Magazine in 2015 talking about forecast value add, forecastability, and some of these topics right here. So help me welcome Sujit. Welcome Sujit. I'm happy to have you on board. I've been thinking about having you on board and talking about that. And when I read your most recent uh, blogs on Arkiva.com, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to come on and talk a little bit about the subject of forecastability. So thank you for being part of this podcast. Eric, very happy to be here. Always fun to talk to you. And uh, forecasting is uh, one of my pet subjects. So very, very yeah. happy. So I think we literally, we, we talked about this years ago. I remember we were actually in, in Arizona uh, at a conference and we uh, first time I presented on forecastability and forecast value add uh, and actually did it with uh, uh, one of the people there at Arkiva uh, actually you know did a, a presentation, a joint presentation back then with him. So when we talk a little bit about forecastability, 
I said, I want to get this in a dictionary. How would you define forecastability as a word then? Great question. Uh, and I agree. Let's have a campaign to get this into the dictionary. But before we do that, uh, my thinking about forecast forecasting in general is it's an empirical science at the end of the day. And all the theories and all the formulas are worth nothing or worth a lot, depending on what good, you know, what the outcome looks like. If you can forecast uh, uh, using the ceiling method, and that by that I mean this is this was told to me by someone that when he has to forecast, he pushes back his chair, stares up at the ceiling, and comes up with a forecast. And I say. Fantastic, how does that go? And sometimes, uh, you know, it works well and sometimes it doesn't. Well, if by that method you can forecast something, but to me, as long as you can do it reliably, it's forecastable. But in more, uh, you know, technical terms, I suppose, we are looking for a definition where we can say applying certain measures, uh, whether it's mathematical or otherwise, we can come to a conclusion that, you know, this is forecastable using some type of a program in a repeatable fashion. And so that to me is the measure. And like I said, on the tail end, the empirical part of it wins out at all times for me in that, okay, if it was not mathematically forecastable, but somehow you're doing a good job of forecasting anyways on a repeatable basis, well, then it also is in some way forecastable. Maybe it simply cannot be quantified. Okay. So then that would be next. I love the ceiling method there. But that then would lead to my next question. Are all items forecastable then? Um, not really. I would say that uh, my experience is, I mean, we can begin with the very simple examples. If something has sold only one time, if you only have one data point, you know, how, what is the forecast of it in the future? or some that you ha you haven't started selling. So those items are very easy to agree to that they are almost impossible to forecast. But then there are, uh, uh, let's take your question maybe in the way you intended it, which is let's say we are looking at something that is more stable, has been selling for a while. Does that mean it's always forecastable? Very often, yes. And there are many different techniques you can bring to bear. But at the end of the day, uh, what I was saying earlier applies. You apply any and all techniques and nothing brings out a, a, a acceptable forecast output that it's not forecastable. So I would say, uh, generally speaking, a lot of time series are forecastable through one or the other technique, but not all. And really the proof is in the pudding. You have to see the end result. And if the end result comes out as somewhat accurate, you can come, come back around and say, okay, this was somewhat forecastable. And, and, and if not, then you have you obviously have to sign that off. I would say this. Uh, we have all heard about long tail. We have heard about how the demand is getting, uh, you know, more and more divided up into more and more products and so on. The portion of the demand that is fundamentally unforecastable has increased. And by the way, uh, also worth adding, when I'm talking about forecastability, I'm talking about the classic definition of uh, measuring the error, which is on a forecast point forecast. There are other ways in ma making something forecastable by saying, well, we'll forecast a range. And as long as we are, we are inside a range, we are good. Well, in that sense, you expand the definition of forecastability and some more items can then become forecastable. Okay. so. So I think we're landing on kind of the def broad definition of, you know, if we can forecast it, it's forecastable. And there are items in the long tail. There's items because we don't have enough data. There's items because of external forces that we really can't forecast. There's some stable items maybe we can forecast. And that's really the forecastable versus non-forecastable. So you mentioned some different tools and tricks we can look to kind of look at our data to decide whether it is forecastable. Before I get to that, I want to give you another tricky question then, because I like to start off with the hard questions and then we'll end on the easy ones. If you ask a lot of people because of COVID, because of everything we're going through, because of 
you know, all the constraints we're seeing in the world right now. I said the world's on fire right now, pretty much with supply constraints, fiscal policies, COVID, political, everything's going on. Right now, uh, there's some executives saying you can't forecast anything. I can't trust what you say. Everything is unforecastable at this point. Is this kind of a good assessment of what's going on or do we need just to kind of increase our tolerances? What are we looking at as far as forecastability in these types of uncertainty that we're seeing? You know, I uh, evaluate that statement in the context of statistical or mathematical forecasting that there is so much variation from what was happening a year and a half ago that you know using that history as some sort of a predictor is out of the window and indeed you are seeing a lot of that but like anything else uh, you know people have said this before necessity is the mother of invention so when these types of situations happen people adapt these techniques to account for these changes so statistical techniques themselves are not stationary and as long as you uh, apply some methodologies to assign more weight to recent uh, observations, uh, maybe isolate certain history, maybe bring out some external factors that might be driving the, the ultimate uh, demand patterns. You can still get decent forecast output. If you purely rely on the traditional time series pattern analysis, they have a point because right now we are operating in a phase which is definitely out of pattern compared to you know last let's say five six years so there's that then the second element uh, is any mathematical forecast only gets you so far and we have always at least at Arkiva advocated the idea of talk to the people get the pulse of the market from the people because if a customer of yours closes a plant in the month of September, where they usually do not close a plan, your mathematics engine would not know that. But your salespeople should. And if we can get input from them, we can improve the forecast. So applying those types of techniques can still keep the time series forecastable. So it's if you if you isolate only to statistical and especially time series pattern analysis, they have a point. But if their intent is to just give up on the science of forecasting, because as I said, there are a lot of different elements, I would have a disagreement with them. Yeah, I would agree. So sorry going down that, but I knew it was a question that was I was gonna get with it was, you know, we're talking about forecastability. I'm hearing that words about forecastability. Getting into more of the traditional analysis of forecastability and back to uh, the blogs that you had, you have under normal type circumstances your your you know skews that you currently are managing what kind of analysis can we do on our current portfolio of products to really determine the forecastability of some of those items uh, and then that would lead to really benchmarking and things of that sort but start off you know what kind of uh, methodologies are you looking at to be able to to determine if your items are forecastable is it just what's my error is there some kind of other things I can do before then? What am I looking at? Well, um, I like to always say to people, before you do any fancy analysis, just take your data and look at where your forecast accuracy has been. And if there are parts of your data that are already at, let's pick a number, 75 plus percent accuracy, which is pretty darn good in most industries. Uh, Heck, that is a clear signal to you. It's forecastable. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it, and you're good to go on that part of the data. But that's maybe a, a cheeky answer, maybe too simplistic. So let's now come back to analysis. The, there are many different things we advocate at Arkiva. Uh, the simplest one is probably also the most popular one, which is called the coefficient of variation where the idea is that you calculate the standard deviation of a time series and divide it by the mean. And uh, very often, uh, uh, the, the uh, cutoff point applied that says, you know, let's say about 0.5 or so. So if, you, if, you, if your value is less than 0.5, people will say this is fundamentally forecastable and anything more than 0.5 is not forecastable. Now that 0.5 might move depending on the person, maybe go to 0.3, maybe go to 0.7. There is no uh, agreed value. But lower the number, the better it is. 
Now, like anything else, this is not a measure that is without problems. For example, it does not take into account the sequence of observations. So if you just look at numbers from 1 through 100, the standard deviation will be a high number. But if they are arranged sequentially, then it's very forecastable because you know the next observation will be 101. Similarly, if it is very seasonal, uh, again, the variability is very high. However, uh, it's still very forecastable. So COV or CV, whichever uh, abbreviation you like to use, it's very popular. I think it's effective. Uh, it helps people, but it's not, as you would imagine, a perfect way of measuring forecastability. However, I always say you cannot have the perfect be the enemy of the good. So I advocate you know, people using it. I don't have any problem with it. Uh, the, the other uh, types of uh, calculations or analysis I would do, for example, is around intermittence. So if you look at the number of gaps between observations, so just to give you an example, if you are looking at data in monthly buckets, and so you have a sale in month one, then nothing in six, month two, nothing in month three, and then you again have a sale in month four. Now you've got two periods with zero observations, right? So if you look at these gaps, the question is, if these gaps are very repeatable, like every one sale you have two, non-zero sale periods, well, that is nice. But very often what you will see is that this gap itself is varying, as well as the peaks of the individual sales are varying. So you want to measure something called an intermittence, uh, where you want to calculate the average delta between the non-zero sales. And it, it, there is a formula associated with it, and there's a cutoff. So if you are more than 1.2, typically we would consider a highly intermittent series. And if that becomes the case, uh, then you will have difficulty forecasting, or at the very least, you will have to use some specialized methods, you know, be it Croston or sporadic methods to, to do the forecasting. Similarly, you can apply uh, types of tests, different types of tests, like there's an example called runs test, which you can do to figure out if a particular time series is seasonal, if a particular time series is intermittent, if it is lumpy, uh, and all of that can then be applied to say, okay, I'm not going to be blind about applying the forecast methods. Using this upfront analysis, I will then apply the appropriate methods to the appropriate time series. And so if, they, if, the seasonal, if seasonality is being de depicted in your analysis by the time series, then you apply that method, uh, for example. So those are some tests we do on the time series analysis. And let me take a pause there, but of course there are more tests to be done on the causal analysis, which we can talk about. Okay, so before, real quick before we get to the causal then, uh, when you're looking at, uh, let's go back to your COV, you're looking at you know coefficient of variation. You mentioned that highly seasonal data might give you a very high COV. You may see 0 0.8, 0 0.9 COV on your data uh, because it's highly seasonal. Should we deseasonalize our data then before we run a COV analysis? Was, is that a possible step someone can do then? That is very reasonable. Also, on the other hand, you can simply run an F test of seasonality to figure out up front. This is a seasonal method and then, sorry, seasonal time series. And then you can just directly go to uh, applying seasonal methods. But yes, you have to be cognizant. If you're going to insist on using COV, you have to be cognizant of deseasonalizing as an example. But you know, the problems on that end do not end there. I mean, that was just an example. What if, for example, you have a time series, you calculate the COV, and then all you do is in every time period, add a million units. So you've just raised the time series higher, right? In that example, the mean has gone up by a tremendous number. So COV will come down because mean is in the denominator. But is that time series any more unforecastable or any more forecastable than it was a minute ago before you added the million to every time period? The answer is no. So there are, uh, there are let's just say like anything else, there are issues with it You know that can take a whole discussion in itself. Okay, so it brings it to another example, uh, bringing back COVID. I mean, so if I did the analysis in 2019, I'm going to have a very different 
result than if I did the analysis now. I'm going to see a lot more uncertainty in my data set running a COV type of analysis because of the nature of what we just went through. Does that mean things are less forecastable now? And does that mean that I should expect more air in my in what I'm get, doing? Well, I mean, if we stop at the time series pattern analysis based forecasting, then the answer would be yes, and you would see a lot more error. Uh, but this might be an ad appropriate time to talk about bringing in external factors. So why Perfect. is why is the demand different in uh, COVID times? You know, uh, I was reading an article uh, only yesterday where they were talking about they are selling more loungewear uh because well we are working from home and we don't have to you know uh, put on business casual or whatever your company requires to come into the office so there's extra demand of that uh they might just need... for the record I'm, I'm business on top i'm pajamas on the bottom you just can't see there you go <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't expect anything different that's great so uh, what is that what are those external elements that are causing the changes that you see we have customers who were selling who are in the business of selling sanitizers and you know their demand pattern shifted dramatically so once you understand that you can apply these external factors you can bring in these external factors you can do a couple of things you can simply say look i want to put a lot more weight on my most recent observations number one Number two, if you, if you are aware of certain external factors, like COVID is going through peak, therefore sanitizer sales should again see a spike, for example. Or it could be a third element of just bringing in people and they're uh, you know, getting some collaborative input from them. So again, I don't like to throw in the towel and say it's unforecastable. Yes, it's unforecastable using the same old technique, but you have a lot of other things in the forecasting tool bag through which it still remains forecastable. You just have to make sure to find the right one and adjust given the uh, new circumstances you're dealing with. Okay, so we determined, I mean, everything's forecastable. We're looking at other causal factors. So we ultimately we can come up with a forecast for anything. We looked at our data set, said we do have this long tail. There are these items over here that I'm, I'm at a point eight you know, you know, 1.2 is my COV on these. Uh, even after I try to de-seasonalize this history, this intermittent demand that I have, you have all these things in this long tail that I truly is unforecastable in that I shouldn't devote a lot of my resource and time to. What do we do with those would be my next question. What do we do with the items that we did this analysis, Pareto, whatever else analysis we did, we have this these tail items that we've determined are problematic. What do we do with them now? Great question. So let, let's let's extend your question to also include things like we have tried collaboration. Maybe we have looked at the causal factors, external factors, and we are not really finding any. Although these days, you know, uh, there are technologies that will search the web and tell you out of ten million factors, these are the three applied to your data set. But let's say you have done all of that. Uh, there are other techniques available in the forecasting toolkit. For example, there is some good research that suggests that um, you can apply groupings to the data and forecast at higher levels and quote unquote inherit uh, some of the properties from the top level down to the lower levels. So you might have you know, seven products that belong to the same product family. And, you know, you at the individual product level, the data might be fundamentally unforecastable. But when you roll it up to the family level, maybe some patterns emerge. Maybe they don't. I mean, let's be clear. But in some cases, they do. And so can you do the forecast at that level and apply those weights, those uh, disaggregate, in other words, those numbers to, to the lower level to get some benefit out of the high level, the forecastability at the aggregate level? Well. So that's another technique available. Um, um, with, with, with respect to with respect to the ultimate in all of this is if it fundamentally comes back to no math works, 
you have no choice but to go to your people and get the input through them. And in that, I always like to say that because salespeople who are typically the people we approach for these types of input, they are not the ones who really love to spend their time forecasting. I'm sure you've run into that. It's very important as a process to ask them for only significant inputs. And there is research that says large inputs add to the forecastability, large inputs add to the forecast accuracy a lot more than small inputs. So it could imply that we go to them and say, hey, give me your 20 most impactful inputs that you can see. So uh, math, there are some techniques available, things like external factors, things like doing things at an aggregate level, but then uh, collaboration is the other kind of uh, you know, uh, technique available to us to improve the forecast accuracy and make it still keep it in the forecastable realm. Great advice. And I like that aggregation. You could also look at aggregation of time. If you're doing daily forecasts, maybe weekly or monthly, a bucket for those. I mean, you may find a different pattern that starts to emerge. And so it's it's all about signal versus noise is what we're trying to develop here. So exactly. I, I like that. So, well, unfortunately, it looks like uh, we're going to be about out of time here. So, I mean, I want to thank you for being part of this uh, podcast. Uh, thank you for the sponsorship that you guys have done for two years now as well. And thank you for the great advice and, and inputs you have uh, on forecastability uh, today as well. Eric, thank you so much. They're very insight insightful questions. And as always, I enjoyed it. Thank you. I'll see you soon. All right. So that was a great interview I just did. He had some great points talking about, you know, how to exactly look at the underlying data. And he had a lot more types of techniques that some of them I never even considered as well. So I'm going to have to go back, rewind and watch that as, again as some of those techniques and, and do a little more research on those. What I wanted to present you at the, the final here is just my kind of three steps in forecastability and how we can utilize that. This, this goes back to my presentation I gave eight years ago in Arizona. First, before I get into those three steps, I want to talk a little bit about the data first, the underlining data. We're going to have most of what we talked about was time series type of data. Time series has different components, level, trend, seasonality, and then everything else that's left is going to be the noise. In that noise, like he said, you can find some maybe causal factors in it. You can maybe find some, you know, different individual, you know, uh, independent variables that are causal factors, promotions, uh, COVID customer sentiment, things of that sort that are causal factors that can explain some of that noise. And then you may have some judgment that understands and can explain some of that noise as well. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is in our data set, determine how much of that is noise, how much we can explain, and then how well can we explain the other, the signal versus the noise. If we can understand that balance, that will give us forecastability. And I said, look, I look at this from a three-step process. Step one, determine the uncertainty in your data. Analyze the history. A lot of what we're talking about is, is our time series data. You may have some causal inputs that explain some of the noise as well, but we're looking at analyzing that history. Analyzing that history utilizing something like a COV, coefficient of variation, or demand variation index. Uh, the only difference where really, one, you're gonna square uh, the, you know, uh, the fitted or the, the variation from the mean, the other you don't square. It's the only really difference between the two. Check it out at IBF.org, I have an article about that. Uh, but you can look at from a coefficient of variation or demand variation index. Ideally, I would also recommend if you can, and you have seasonal patterns, looking at it as a de-seasonalized data, detrended data, taking out some of the predictive, taking out the known variables that you can have. Now, be careful. If you start taking out all those, you pretty much just have a forecasted data is what you have. So make sure it's truly seasonality, truly trends, truly predictable, uh, predictive variables that you're taking out. Ideally, you want as close to the raw data set as possible because what you're truly determining is the uncertainty in the data. So I got no problem if you just take the raw data and run a COV analysis, DVI analysis, whatever, on that data set 
to really determine what the uncertainty in your data is. And I'll get to the reason why next, because the next step is you want to determine the how, for, how good you are at forecasting it. I'm not exactly talking necessarily about a mean absolute percentage error or a loop mean square error uh, or any type of forecast accuracy. Yes, that's going to give you your forecast error, but in theory, your forecast accuracy or your MAPE or your loop mean square error or whatever measurement you're using to calculate uncertainty on your output should be highly correlated to your data set uncertainty. So your COV should be pretty closely related to your MAPE, loop mean square, whatever forecast accuracy. There is a correlation there. What the difference will be is what you need to measure. That's forecast value add. That is the difference. That's the value you're adding beyond the base outputs based on a naive, based on other outputs. Any change in a process input that you're doing to a forecast, the difference between the end forecast that you do and just the pure statistical forecast, the difference is forecast value add. So measuring forecast value add is really what I'm talking about here in step two. Not your just your error, but your forecast value add. Are you adding value? Then step three, comparing those two. You can do a four box where you have COV versus forecast value add, or you want to Pareto both of them. Pareto your COV, uh, Pareto your forecast value add. You can put it in a nine box if you want to, but ultimately what you're doing is you're comparing on your X, Y axis, your uncertainty in your data set to your forecast value add on how you're improving from a statistical and baseline type of forecast of what you're doing. What this is going to show you then in that type of four box is things that are low forecast value add or maybe even negative forecast value add and things that have a high variability, high uncertainty, high COV above 0.7. Possibly this is a no touch. This is a pure naive forecast or you utilize supply targets on this or maybe you're using some of the aggregation techniques that, that Sujit mentioned as well. Things that then are high forecast value add, you're adding value to it. If they're low variability, okay, collaborative forecast could be high internal touch. Things that have high variability, then it's a must need touch. You, you're not gonna get there through statistical methods alone. You're gonna have to add market intelligence, have to add external variables to it. You're gonna have to look at you know different types of inputs into your process that are that you currently are added, look at how you could add more of those to add more to the forecast value add. What this is gonna give you is, your, is a true forecastability of items. Items that are not only on the scale from uncertainty of the data set, but it also takes into account what you can do, what you're adding value for, external variables, process steps, judgment, whatever it may be, to increase your forecast value add comparing these two on a chart. Well, I hope I don't get canceled or boycotted, especially by salespeople after this one. I know this was controversial. Hope you stuck with it. You learned something with it as well. My name is Eric at IBF.org. That's Eric at IBF.org. Once again, thank you, Arkiva. Thanks for being part of this as well. But thank you, Arkiva, your one plan SNOP software solution. So thank you, IBF as well. Thank you, everybody. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, and make sure that I don't offend anybody else. Please don't forget, wash your hands.